All right, everybody, let's get started. Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. I'm your host, Chris Smith, and I work here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, where we are broadcasting today's very special program to you. Now, the Lunchtime Discovery Series, of course, we live stream it for you. It's actually organized and coordinated by the folks in the Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. And the month of February is a very special time. It is Black History Month. And so we've also partnered with the DEQ Diversity and Inclusion Committee to bring you what has so far and I think will continue to be an incredible month of programming where we are meeting some amazing people, hearing incredible stories, learning about science, nature, the environment, conservation, communication, and more. So today, I think, is going to be no different. We've got a great program for you. Uh, and I've been chatting with today's guest speaker, uh, you know, behind the scenes before we got started. And listen, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to learn some cool stuff and hear some great stories today. I'll remind everybody that the Lunchtime Discovery Series is interactive. That's right. You get to participate as well. Make sure that as we go throughout the program, leave your thoughts, stories, and questions for today's guest speaker over in the chat. If you're on YouTube or if you're watching on Facebook down in the comments, I've got those pulled up. So that after the presentation, we'll move into audience Q&A, and I'll take your questions and pose them for today's guest, who I think we should meet now. We should probably jump into the program. Uh, today, everybody, our guest speaker is Derek Lugo. Derek is the author of a memoir entitled The Unlikely Through Hiker. He's the host of a podcast called The Unlikely Stories Podcast, which I'm going to have to dive into after this, I think. Uh, and he's an adventurer. So I'm very excited to go on an, an adventure today via the internet. Derek, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. So I am Derek Lugo, the author of The Unlikely Through Hiker. And I actually want to share my screen here with you guys so I can continue sharing this story with you. There we go. So, like I said, I am the author of The Unlikely Through Hiker. Um, it's a humorous telling of my through hike of the Appalachian Trail. And a through hiker, if some of you don't know, is someone that hikes an entire long trail uh, in one calendar year or one hiking season. So I started the AT March and I finished in September. But before I did the AT, I had no experience at all. I've never hiked, never camped out, never pitched a tent. I didn't know anything about the outdoors. I'm from New York City. Uh, the only thing I knew was what the city had to offer. This was my wilderness. These were my markers. And this was how I got around. The city was my life. And this is the wildlife. And you're probably wondering, how, do, how did I go, get from New York City being a city slicker and hiking the Appalachian Trail, living in the woods for six months? Well, I'm a big reader. I love books. If you recommend a book to me, I will read it. If you see me, I'll have a book in my bag, my back pocket, somewhere near me. And someone handed me this book. They said, read this. It's a funny read. And I said, well, I like, I like funny. I'll read it. Read it. Bill Bryson's A Walk in the Woods. And yeah, it was, it was funny. Um, it was a great read. One of the best reads I've ever read. But the one thing that stuck out was this trail that he made sound so hard, uh, the Appalachian Trail. And I thought, you know what? One day I would love to do that. Never thinking I would. It was kind of like a pipe dream, like wanting to run a marathon or travel around the world or hike the Appalachian Trail. It wasn't something I thought I would actually do, but it was there in the back of my mind. I said, you know what? Maybe, who knows? So, the only thing I actually knew about the Appalachian Trail, what was in that book, whatever was in that book <clears throat> was the only thing I knew about it. And I knew, like I said, it went from Georgia to Maine. 
and I had to hike it. But I didn't even know if I liked hiking. I just knew that it was a challenge and it was something that I wanted. I really wanted to do. One thing led to another. Years after I read the book, A Walk in the Woods, I had free time. I had the opportunity to do some kind of adventure and the Appalachian Trail popped in my head. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do it. One night I was thinking about it, woke up next morning and I told my friend, started telling my family and friends that I'm going to do this long trail and I'm going to hike it from Georgia. I mean, starting in the South. And the reaction I got was, if see that face right there? That's Nina. In my book, I mentioned her. I'm actually going to read a really short section where I told her she was one of the first people I told I was going to hike the Appalachian Trail. And I'm going to share her reaction with you. Okay, this is right after I say, hey, I'm hiking the Appalachian Trail. Okay, why would you want to do that? She says, frowning. What? Because I can't. Because I've never done anything like this before, I say. Is she messing with me? It's an adventure, something I've wanted to do for a while. You've never mentioned it before. She shoots back at me as if catching me in a lie. I'm sure I did. Look, that's not the point. I'm hyped. What are you going to eat? Will you have cell service so you can order food? Do they deliver out there? She barrages me with questions, ignoring my efforts to explain. I will bring a cell for when I'm in town, resupplying, and if there's an emergency. I'll be on top of mountains, which I think will be outside a delivery and maybe cell service. I say, <clears throat> excuse me, I say not truthfully knowing the answer. Hmm. I don't know about this. How long will it take you? She asks unable to grasp the thought of me doing something so out of character. I'm going to try to do it in five months, I say proudly. You're going to live in the mountains for five, for five months, she repeats, squinting her eyes at me as if I were too far away for her to see. Before I can answer, she continues, listen, pretty boy, I know you. You are the most well-groomed metrosexual black man in New York City. You in the woods without your mirror, your beauty products, or your designer clothes, please. How will you shower? Wait, I don't have beauty products. Okay, maybe lotions? What about the manicures? Hmm, okay, I get manicures once in a while. What about, okay, okay, I get it. I say, wanting to finally get my point across, before she convinces me I'm too meticulous about my appearance to live out in the woods. So that was pretty much the reaction I got from all my family, my friends. They just couldn't understand why I would want to do something like that. My parents thought, my mom thought I was a little nutty. My friends in New York City thought I was too city-fied. And my brother, well, he was like, look, dude, Take a machete with you because it's dangerous there. I said, dude, I'm not taking a machete. He said, yeah, take a machete. They come in small sizes. You can strap it to your chest and you go. And I said, look, there's a big difference between a through hiker in the woods and a dude with a machete in the woods. It's not going to happen. Worse yet, a dude with dreadlocks <laughs> and a machete. <laughs> I hope you guys appreciate this. It took me a long time to Photoshop that. So I kept trying to explain to my family and friends that it's safe out there. It's okay. And once I got their, their blessings, or I should say their warnings, I decided, you know what? I'm going to get my gear and I'm going to go. So I went to the nearest outfitter in New York City. I ran in there. First person I saw, I said, hey, I'm going to hike the Appalachian Trail. Can you help me get some gear? And she turns around. She's like, oh, that's nice, dear, but I don't work here. So <laughs> I was like, OK. So I went to the actual person that worked there and I said, hey, I'm going to through hike the Appalachian Trail. Can you help me get some gear? So the guy, luckily, the guy happened to he had just finished through hiking the year before. So he knew exactly what I needed. And he started asking me questions. He said, hey, so 
what kind of pack do you normally like? Do you like a heavier pack, a bigger pack, smaller pack? And I said, well, I don't know. I've, I've never hiked before. And he, and he said, well, you never hiked before, but you're going to through hike the Appalachian Trail. And I said, yeah, like, people do that, right? He was like, okay, <laughs> Just, let's, let's do it. So we got all my gear, most of my gear. And as I'm leaving, I turn around and I see him and I, I see his face and I can almost read his mind. He's like, this dude is going to get himself hurt. But he made the sale and he was like, okay. So within a week and a half, two weeks of deciding I was going to hike the Appalachian Trail, normally people plan this for months, sometimes years. I decided within a week and a half, two weeks, I'm going to go. And I started hiking the trail. So this right here is actually the approach trail. It's the beginning of, it's eight mile, eight and a half miles to Springer Mountain, which is the actual start of the Appalachian Trail. And officially, this is not the beginning of the AT, but I, I say it is because it was one of the hardest climbs. It was like 750 steps over like a, a waterfall and it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. And I thought I can do it. I was like, I'm in shape. I can do this, but I've never climbed steps with like a 40 pound pack. So when I saw this archway, it was, I've seen in pictures before I've seen videos on it and it hit me. I'm going to do this. And my stomach started to hurt. And I started thinking like, why am I doing this? I have all this pack. I mean, all this gear in my pack, and I didn't know how to use any of it. And as fast as that thought came, it left. I said, I have, I have nowhere else to go. I had planned five to six months to be out in the woods. I was homeless. So I might as well just do something <laughs> with it. So I took the first step and I got to Springer Mountain, eight and a half miles, pretty hard. And I started pitching my tent. Now, this isn't my actual tent. I found this online, but it looked exactly how my tent was, was looking when I when I started pitching it. And I was struggling with it. Um, a lot of the stuff that I should have learned years ago, I was learning how to do that day. And this the tent I had, I was struggling with the, the tent stakes. I couldn't get it in the ground. The ground was too hard. And this other through hiker came by. He grabbed the rock and he tapped all the, the stakes down and he looked at me, tossed the rock and he walked away. And I said, dude, you are a genius. So I grabbed the rock and I put it in my pack because I'm going to need it for later. Right. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't do that. But it was one of those things that the little things. There's a, a chapter. One of the first chapters in my book is called Lessons at Springer Mountain, where I learned everything I needed to learn uh, about or most of the things I needed to learn to through hike as far as using my gear. So I learned how to use my water pump to filter uh, my water. I learned how to pitch a tent, I learned how to use my mini stove. Uh, you have to hang your food. So there's like bear cables. We call them bear cables because you want to get them away from the bears. I learned how to do that. And all these things I learned that day. And I'm not sure what other hikers I in my head, I thought this was a normal thing to do. People just, you know, if you don't have the experience, you just do it. Just go ahead and do it. But um, a month later, I ran into one of the, the hikers that was there on my first day. And he said, oh, man, you're still on a trail. I'm surprised, you know, because they although they didn't voice it, they probably were like, hey, this dude is not going. He's not going to make it. But. I was determined. Uh, it was a challenge for me. Eventually, I learned how to do the things that I needed to do the hike. But that day, um, I had learned how to use the gear. The next day was my first official day on the Appalachian Trail. And I knew one thing. I didn't know much about the AT. But the one thing I didn't know that I had to follow this marking. Now, this marking is a white blaze. And it leads you throughout the entire Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine. So the rule of thumb is if you're standing in front of a white blaze, which the white blazes could be on a tree, could be on bridges, rocks. Sometimes I saw it on, on grass. 
um, it was like a rock and it was covered with grass, but you could see it. Um, and the rule of thumb is if you're standing next to one, you should be able to see the next one, which wasn't necessarily true. There was times when I didn't see a white blaze for a while, but it is a 2200 mile blade uh, trail and it's well marked. So I said, you know what? I got this. I just got to follow the white blaze and I'm good. But then I saw this blue one and I said, what's going on with <laughs> what's going on with this blue blaze? Turns out that the blue blaze will take you to side tra uh, trails. So it will take you to a shelter. Uh, it could take you to a trailhead, water, uh, a privy. So another thing I needed to know was the blue, the blue blaze. So you have the white blaze, the blue blaze, those two I needed to, to, to figure out. And hikers that started knew this. There was one moment and it's in the book where I was looking for the water source at a shelter. And I asked, uh, uh, another hiker and he said, it's, it's right there. And I look and I'm like, where he's like, see that blue blaze right there. And <laughs> I was like, Okay, that okay. and then and it hit me. Okay, blue blaze will take me to the water source. So I had that. Okay, white blaze, blue blaze. I got this. My first day on the trail. It was the first day where I'm hiking alone. Now I'm from New York City. I'm used to New York sounds. Um, I'm not used of the sounds in 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 the wild. So I would hear like squirrels running on dry leaves and it sounded like a stampede of boars and I would jump. I would see like fallen trees that look like a dinosaur or a dragon or something, you know, like these figures all over. So my mind started playing tricks on me and I was just, I, I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this for six months. Luckily, there's a lot of people on the AT uh, when you first start, uh, the percentage of people that actually complete a trip, uh, a through hike is I think 25%. When I first started writing my book, that was the percentage. And I think it's still the same. Um, but as you go along, it starts thinning out. So within a few days of my through hike, I connected with a group of people. Now, this is a it was between 10 and 12 of us. And I named us the moving village because when we pitched the tent, our tents in camp, it looked like a village. And then the next morning we got up and we moved, hence the moving village. So these were my people. This was my trail family. And within a week of our hiking together, of our through hike, everyone here had a trail name except for this guy. And they said, well, we're going to give you a name. We're going to give you a trail name. We're going to go to camp. We're going to, we're going to learn a little bit about you. And we're going to give you a trail name. So first of all, I can't believe my trail name was not Captain Jack Sparrow. Like, look at this dude. Don't I, don't I look like a pirate? <laughs> just, there's no way. I don't look like a, your, your typical hiker. Uh, so I go, we go to camp and I share a little bit about myself. And I tell them how I have, I didn't know what I was getting into. I have zero experience uh, hiking, camping, pitching tent, or any of that stuff. From New York City, metrosexual, you know, got to stay groomed. I need my, you know, I need to look fresh and clean. And I would say, I would tell them that at the time, I had, I didn't have a beard. I would shave. In fact, I didn't grow a beard until after I threw hike the Appalachian Trail. So on the Appalachian Trail, I would go to a stream and I would shave. And I would give myself a bird bath. Um, and I would tell them, you know, that's what I, I was planning to do. Because through hikers are known not to shower for days, weeks. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> that ain't, I ain't rolling like that. I got to stay fresh and clean. And um, I joked around about wanting to have a full length mirror in my backpack so I can pull it out and I can be like, all right, I can twist my dreads. I can stay groomed. And one of the hikers was like, you're a Mr. Fabulous. And I said, uh-uh, that ain't, that ain't happening. He's like, no, you're, you're a Mr. Fabulous. I said, no. There's no way I'm going to go around calling myself Mr. Fabulous. They said, no, you got to do it. Just try it. I was like, no, that sounds weird. Like, just imagine me going up to people and saying, you know, hi there, I'm Mr. Fabulous. It's like, it sounds creepy. And they're like, yeah, if you say it like that, don't say it like that. So 
they were like, look, use it for a couple of days and and see how it works. Now, a trail name is if if you guys are don't know what it is. A trail name is something that hikers get when they're through hiking the AT. You're doing something new. You're out of like, quote unquote, the real world. And uh, you get like a like a nickname on the trail, a moniker. And um, it kind of it's you get it whether it's you normally get a trail name if you do something like interesting or say something, look a certain way. Um, people try to call me a bunch of different names, at, but you don't have to accept the first name that's given to you because remember you're going to be out there for five to six months and maybe longer and it's it has to be a name that you that you dig and i wanted a name that had a story um people are trying to call me like new york or marley because i have dreadlocks and i said there's not a story there and um they i was convinced to use mr fabulous now i decided to use it for a few days um, but one of the questions you get when people find out you, 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 you're through hiking is what's your trail name? And I would almost apologize when, when I would tell them my name was Mr. Fabulous. I would go, well, you know, they, I, I didn't name myself, uh, but it's Mr. Mr. Fabulous, you know, and the reaction I thought I was going to get was like, yeah, who's this guy thinking he's, he's Mr. Fabulous? You know, what's that about? But it, that wasn't the case. I got smiles laughter there was a story behind it um and it turns out that miss and i found this out later that mr fabulous was a character in the blues brothers movie um is, i think his name was mr fab but he was a trumpet player i think and he was a suave kind of looking guy and um it kind of fit with what i was doing but uh what turned out that the Mr. Fabulous name was more than just me. And I was starting to really dig that because every time I shared the story and I said, Mr. Fabulous, like it was hard for people to say Mr. Fabulous and not smile, you know? And so I was getting smiles, laughter, and I was like, okay, I'm digging this. But the one story I will share with you guys, the moment that I decided that I was going to keep the trail name was one day, one day I was hiking by myself and there was a group of elderly day hikers. It was like a dozen of them. And <clears throat> they were going southbound. I was going north. I stepped aside. We talked a little bit. They found out I was through hiking. They were wishing me luck, asking me questions. Uh, and the last person, she was much older than them. She was like, she must have been like 200 years old. She was small. She had a cane. And she like had an aide with her. And she was like walking really slow. And she came up to me and she heard I was through hiking. She said, she asked, what, so what's your trail name? And I go, ma'am, it's, it's Mr. Fabulous. And without missing a beat, she goes, oh my gosh, I've been waiting for Mr. Fabulous my entire life. And she reaches up, gives me a kiss on my cheek. And she like leaves with like a little pep in her step. And she's like twirling her cane. And her aide is like chasing after her. And I'm like, whoa, I, Mr. Fabulous is the cure to old age. Like I, it was amazing. At that moment, I decided that I was going to keep it because it wasn't just about, about me. It was how the reaction that people were getting. And there was a story behind it. And this story now that I share with you guys. So to this day, um, when I first got off the trail, people tried to call me Mr. Fabulous. And it was kind of weird because normally other hikers will say, we'll call you by your trail name. But then when the book came out and I've been doing talks for a while and I'm pretty known in the outdoors now that now if you call me Mr. Fabulous, it's normal. Uh, and I don't feel weird about it because, again, it's not about me. It's about the story and how others feel with the whole Mr. Fabulous uh, name. So that's how I got Mr. Fabulous. And that's why I kept it. And I'm going to stick with that story. Um, the thing about and it, let's. I learned a lot on the Appalachian Trail. Um, there's a lot of lessons on there. And this guy right here, his name is Birdman. That's, his trail name is Bird uh, Birdman. First of all, doesn't he look like a lawn gnome, like with the white beard and the, and, and the red cap? Doesn't he, like, he, he was one of the nicest guys I've, I ever met. First day I met him, he started taking pictures. He just saw me and started snapping away. And I'm like, what's going on? Like, you know, but. 
I don't shy away from a camera. So I started posing and all that. But I was still like, why is this guy taking pictures of me? So he told me that he met a through hiker, a guy that through hiked the Appalachian Trail a year, the year before. And he asked that through hiker if there was something different, if there was something he can do differently, what would it be? And the guy said that he took a lot of pictures of mountains, of great scenery, trees, grass, dirt, all, all the wildlife stuff, um, nature stuff. And he said the one thing he wished he took picture of was more people, uh, the people he encountered. And it hit me right away. I knew instantly what he was talking about because you can take a photo of a scenery and a lot of times when you're out there, you, you know, you, you want to capture the moment, but you can't with a photo. It's a beautiful photo, but I can't tell you how many times I show a photo uh, of a mountain to someone. They're like, oh, that's nice, but you're not going to capture that moment. But if you take a photo of a person, I, I come to realize that there's, there's a lot behind that, that photo. Like I'll remember their trail name. I remember the conversation we had. I remember that moment. Like when I see this photo, I remember that story he told me. I remember how nice he was. I remember how his smile like that day as if it was, and I threw like the Appalachian Trail 10 years ago as, as if it was yesterday, I remember it. So I decided, you know what, from that moment on, I'm going to take pictures of everyone I encounter. So I was just snapping away. I was that creepy. I wasn't creepy about it, but I, I would take photos of other hikers um day hikers through hikers people i met along the way trail angels now trail angels are people that leave trail magic and trail magic is when people leave stuff for hikers uh like food hikers are always hungry we're hiking every day we're burning thousands of calories um and you're not going to replace them so food is great trail magic so they'll leave like a cooler with like soda snacks and all that by the trailhead um, getting a ride into town, a shower, <laughs> you know, like we'll give you a ride into town, take a shower. That was my favorite. One of my favorites is shower. And uh, when I was in the New Jersey, New York section, it was a heat wave. Um, and uh, there was the water sources were dried and people would leave gallons of water by the trail. And these were locals. And that was the best trail magic I could get. So I was taking pictures of, um, you know, trail angels and the people I encountered. Um, and it helped also with telling my story. Cause when I got off the Appalachian trail, I halfway through my hike, I decided I was going to, uh, write about the Appalachian trail. And I think I froze here. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm still on. Um, I decided I was going to halfway through my hike. I decided I was going to, um, write about it. And, Photos really helped with that story. Um, I would look at it and, you know, other stuff would pop up. So, um, yeah, I, I just photos was huge for me. In fact, for years after that, um, I was still posting new photos. I had taken so, so many photos on the Appalachian Trail. Um, I was an unlikely hiker. There's many reasons why I was unlikely. Um, my book is called The Unlikely Through Hiker for many reasons. One, because I, um, I'm from New York City, city guy, never through hike before. But also there was another reason that I didn't realize it was a thing was that I was the only person of color that season to through hike the Appalachian Trail. And um, it, it, was, it, and it, it blew my mind because I couldn't understand it. I, I couldn't wrap my mind around mind around it because I'm from New York City and the melting pot of the world. And I have friends from all over the place, but it was true. And there was um, one day and there, people were coming up to me and saying, hey, you know, we're so glad you're out here, you know, through hiking. And I said, well, I'm glad you're out here, you know, and they were thanking me. And I, I didn't understand until they, they actually straight up told me like, hey, we're glad you're out here. And for me, it was kind of sad because I wasn't thinking that when I first started, but then now I'm searching. Now I'm like, okay, this can't be true. This is sad. This can't be true. So I would look, see if there was, you know, other people that look like me or whatever. And I would see day hikers, a couple day hikers that were um, people of color, but it was when I would talk to them, it was 
their first day ever doing a hike. Uh, and for me, it was kind of, again, like I said, it was kind of sad and it gave me a reason to share my story. Another reason, because first of all, I finished the AT and love with the outdoors, with the Appalachian Trail, with hiking. And I wanted to share that. And um, also wanted to share, you know, how likely it was for me to, out there, to be out there. First of all, I want, I want to actually go back. To, I want to go to this photo. And yeah, there's a lot of reasons why I was unlikely. But like, look at these bandanas. Like, what, what, what was going on? I, first of all, I miss looking like this. But there's two things I couldn't go back to New York and do. I couldn't go back and call myself, have my friends call me Mr. Fabulous. Trust me, I tried. Nina was not not having it. And I couldn't look like this unless I was in Times Square and I was like juggling or something like that. But there's no way. I could, and, I, and I totally miss looking like that. Um, but yeah, there was many reasons that um, it changed my life. Many reasons that I was unlikely. but walking into this, doing or hiking into this, um, I didn't realize the impact it would have um, on my life. I didn't realize that it would actually change, not just change my life. And people say, before I threw hike the AT, even along with the AT, they're like, this is going to change your life. And I was like, yeah, people say that all the time. Um, but within a few weeks, it's it wasn't something that there was a, um, I'm going to tell a quick story about someone on, uh, we were camping and someone said, Hey, we hear stories about people, um, saying that this would change your life. Do you guys feel that? Like she didn't feel like it was changing her life and people would give their input. And I, I mentioned that, you know, I don't think it's about, you know, you hiking on the trail and all of a sudden the clouds part and there's a voice, a deep voice that says, this is your life. Like, that's not what it's about. Um, and when you're out there, I know for myself, um, being from New York City, um, a lot of distractions and being on the trail, I was able to complete my thoughts. And um, being a writer, um, having all these thoughts, um, it was really nice to be out there and be able to actually finish that thought. And <clears throat> it was a feeling more than anything that my life was changing. And one of the biggest impacts was that people, the people I encountered and the way I felt about humanity changed. Um, not that I was, I'm, I was always a people person, but um, being from New York City, you know, I have a chapter called A Suspicious Mind where you encounter a stranger and, you know, you're going to be looking for your wallet. Like, okay, where's my wallet? You know, because they're, especially in the streets, like they're going to normally when I got someone came up to me, they wanted something, you know, and um, and on the, in, in real life, when you meet strangers, wherever you are, an event or whatever, you need that icebreaker. Just the, you need that icebreaker to connect with someone. But on the Appalachian Trail, that icebreaker was already there. You you're doing a through hike. And within meetings, uh, another through hiker or someone on the trail, you become friends. The next day, you're best friends. And then after that, you're family. So the trail was almost like, and I, and I mentioned this in the book, where time just went faster on a trail, um, where you were out there for six months, but it felt like six years. And it really, to that point, it really impacted, um, again, my life. Now, I don't want to ruin the end for you guys, but I did finish the Appalachian Trail. This is the Katahdin sign. This is the sign that through hikers, this is what, what's on our mind. This is what we're aiming for. This is our goal to get to this spot. And, I've, and a lot of hikers um, sitting on the, on, the, on the sign and doing a pose is what you think about. And I remember... Um, thinking about it, I said, you know what, I'm going to bring my trekking poles. And I'm, I wanted to do like, like an Avenger pose, you know, like I wanted to do something like that with my trekking poles. And um, I got up there and all that just went out of my mind. I started crying. And there was a, a, a film crew up there, just they captured my, the finish, the summit of my through hike. 
And uh, I didn't want to cry in front of people because I didn't want to ugly cry, but it's hard not to. And it was just like over. I was like, I don't care. You can. And I was bawling. And um, I decided just to sit first. You want people. I love this um, about um, about what my moment up there was that I was one of the last to get up there and people just walked away from the sign and let me have my moment with the sign. And a lot of people will sit on it, will climb up on it. But the, one of the things, the first thing they do is kiss the sign. I said, I don't know about me kissing the sign. So I grabbed one of my bandanas and I rubbed it down and kind of like touched it. <laughs> but um, I climbed up and I just, I just embraced the moment, the experience, uh, everything. And a hiker just happened, happened to capture that, this photo, that moment, going back to capturing moments with photos every time I see this. Um, I remember that moment. It's very touching. And um, I remember a, a lot of the feelings that that went into that uh, that moment that I was able to complete going from no experience to now I have I've been in the in the woods, in the wilderness for six months, and I finally completed a through hike. Um, and that's my presentation. But I want to add that. I'm going to do another, I have a bunch of other adventures uh, that I'm doing. And if you follow me on the social media or go to my website, my IG actually, I'm posting there every day in this new adventure that's coming up. And I'll share that in the Q&A um, is going to be big. It's going to be like the 8T. So thank you for having me, guys. And I think we're going to do a Q&A now, right? That's right. We're going to do a Q&A now. Everybody, let's give Derek a great big round of applause wherever you happen to be. Uh, or, you know, drop little clapping hands emojis into the chat mm -hmm. to express your thanks. Uh, I am, I'm kind of in awe of you, Derek. That was, that was very special. To go from, to go from very little like outdoor nature types of experience and then to tackle something like the Appalachian Trail is that's that's very impressive like i wouldn't do that I, yeah, i've I, been out you it's, know it's i'm a not little, from new york city yeah it's a it's a little nutty i think about that now and i'm like what was i thinking like people come up to me and they say hey i don't have any experience you think i can do it i'm like no first of all find out if you like hiking you know go out for a couple of days and camp <laughs> you know don't just go out and do the at because remember i've never camped Normally people have the experience, they have all the gear and they've been out there for a while. You know, what if I didn't like uh, camping or hiking, then I would have been stuck out there hating, but I would have, because in my head, I said, I don't care if I don't like it, I'm going to finish it because it was a challenge. Luckily I fell in love with it, but yeah, it's like one of those things that I think back and I'm like, mm, that wasn't the brightest thing to like not have that experience, you know? So then what was the, um, like, what's the, the spirit or the determination? What's that reservoir for you to jump into a program, a project like that? And just to say, you know what, it doesn't matter that I don't have, you know, the previous experience that other people might have. I want to do it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. It, I'm, I'm a big storyteller. I love hearing stories. I love telling stories. Um, I love when older people share stories. Like I can sit down and listen to an older person tell stories of, you know, I, for hours. And I always felt, and I, that's why I read a lot or still read a lot. And, but I didn't want to just read about it. I wanted to start uh, having my own adventures so I can share and have stories. Um and at the time, this was 10 years ago, that challenge was like, okay. Like, I think also it was like, I was naive about it. Like they say ignorance is bliss. And, and then in this situation, it, it was because if I really thought about it hard enough, and again, I didn't get on the trail. I got on a trail a week and a half, two weeks after I decided I was going to do it. So it wasn't like I was planning it. And I was thinking about it for a long time, finding all these things that could go wrong. Um, and there was a lot 
that I had going against me because I had I didn't have the experience. But the one thing I knew that I had to stick with was um, being positive about it and taking everything in, not necessarily embracing everything, but knowing things was were going to happen while I threw hike, like I was going to hike in the rain, the cold. And my peeps are from the tropics. I like warm weather and being out there in the cold. Woo, but I knew I was I was going to do it. I didn't know I was going to hike in the snow which I ended up doing, I hiked in a, in a, in a snowstorm, which was terrifying. And it's, it's, it's in the book, but um, yeah, it was, I guess the, for me, the challenge was so powerful that it was enough to get me started on the Appalachian trail. But if I didn't have other factors coming into it, like loving the trail, the people that were there, not judging me and helping me along the way, that helped me through it. So I had the start where, okay, I got the challenge. And then once I got going, the people helping me. And then the trail ended up me being more than just a trail. It was the community, which was something huge that is a was a big part of my through hike that I didn't even know. And the book is a lot, has a lot to do with the people I encountered. So I think with that mindset having a little bit of luck and everything falling into place that I was able to actually do that. So, yeah. That's excellent. Thank you. All right. We do have questions rolling in, in the chat. Yeah. The first one comes from Carrie who wants to know, do you still hike? <laughs> or did do you I get all the hiking you need? Do I, do I still hike? Um, it's funny. <laughs> my friends and my family in New York city, they were like, they went from not wanting me to go to when they came back, they were like, oh, Derek, like they were like experts of the Appalachian Trail. My brother was like, if you can do it, I can do it. You know, and we ended up doing a hike from New York City to the Appalachian Trail. I didn't know you can I didn't know you can do that from the George Washington Bridge oh, wow. to Bear Mountain. And um, they actually um, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy did a short film on that that hike called trail brothers. You can see it, you can see it online and it goes where I have the experience. My brother doesn't, but he thinks he can do it. And his experience and his reaction, long story short, turns out that he's not really a hiker, but he loves camping. So he'd rather just drive up to a camp and just pitch a tent and look at the stars. He loves that jump in the lake. But I like to work for that. I like to hike for, he doesn't like to hike, but we hike 50 <laughs> miles from New York City to the AT, he was not, he was not happy with me at all. I was like, dude, just imagine doing this for six months. So yes, I still hike. I moved from New York City to, um, on, in 2020 to Asheville, North Carolina, surrounded by mountains and trails. I hike almost every day. And uh, I talked about the new adventure I'm going to do. Um, I'm actually going to through hike the Continental Divide Trail in April. So that's about 3,100 miles different than the AT. It's a desert. You start in the desert, New Mexico, and it goes all the way up to uh, Montana, the border of Montana and Canada. So it's been 10 years since I through hiked. And um I hope I still have my the through hike in me. I, I love hiking, but through hiking is a is a different a different thing. You know, you're not just I'm not just going like this and I can go. Um, I have that heavy pack. Um, so and in a desert, I'm going to need a lot, a lot of extra water. So, yeah, man, hiking. Hiking is my life now. Like I went from being a city guy uh, to when I finished the AT, I decided I was going to write about it. So it took me six months to hike the Appalachian Trail, but I was reliving it with my writing. So it took me about a year and a half, two, two years with the book. And then I started doing talks. So I'm reliving the AT for years. So it never left me. A lot of people will through hike or people will through hike and then they'll move on and do other things. It stayed with me because it changed who I was. It changed what I was, my purpose in life. So yes. Long story short, I still hike. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Madison wants to know what you ate every day. MREs? Mm -mm. They're too heavy. Um, so you want to carry 
you know, you want it to be light. So ramen noodles, super nut light. I did rice sides. When I first started, you got to read the book because okay. in the book, I was carrying like so much. And what I did was I was carrying ready to eat uh, Indian food and they're kind of big and they, they have water in it. They're heavy. And I had like 24 packets of tuna and salmon. So I had weight. I had like, I don't know, like two weeks worth of food. And I really only needed like five days. So I would eat for breakfast. I would have um, oatmeal with my coffee, pop tarts. Uh, and then I would have energy bars when I'm through hiking, when I'm as while I'm hiking for lunch, I would have peanut butter is huge with hikers. The protein is just so I'll have peanut butter with tortilla, Nutella at the time. Um, I'm, ve- I'm a vegan now, so I can't have Nutella, but I can have peanut butter. And uh, for dinner, I would like I said, I'll have ramen, um, rice sides. Yeah, anything that was light, but when you go into town, like I said, you're burning a lot of calories, thousands of calories. You'll eat whatever. And I didn't gain any weight at all. I didn't gain or lose weight. I stayed the same, the same weight. But when you go into town, you're eating like a whole, a whole pizza, <laughs> you know, it's like whatever you can get, you know, I, I, and I would eat veggie burger at the time I was a vegetarian. So I would eat a veggie burger when I went into town and stuff like that. But now this time around, I'm going to go into a through hike as a vegan. So it's going to be a little bit more challenging. Um, but for the most part, most a lot of rice sides, ramen noodles, all that peanut butter, it's uh, vegan. So, yeah, that's pretty much what I ate. Sounds tasty. Yeah. Sn- Snickers was my I favorite. Can... I loved Snickers. Like it, it gave me energy boost like that. And they said I remember reading A Walk in the Woods. And it was like, don't bring Snickers because bears love that. And I was like, you know what? I can't, I can't help it. I love Snickers. <laughs> and if you read the book, I had some issues with bears where I got chased by a bear, followed by another one. So there was some bear activity around me. <laughs> bears and Snickers. Bears All right. Snickers. right. I'm going to hold on. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Steph writes that. They know somebody who's considering the AT after high school Mm -hmm. or not because they might be encouraging this person to get more experience because they're 18 years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, What do you think about being 18 and hitting the AT right out of school? There is a well, when you through hike, that happens. You're either, you know, in between jobs. You're mm-hmm. in between like, you know, high school and, 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 and college or you're taking a break from school. Um, so those are the type of people or you're retired. Those are the type of people that are actually on the Appalachian Trail. When I hiked, there was three hike, two or three hikers that were 17. that had just graduated from high school. And they were fine. When you're that age, it's I hated watching them hike because I needed my trekking poles and I'm struggling. And it was like they were walking. It was like Jesus walking on water. They were just like super. It was, they were gliding. <laughs> and I was like, they didn't have trekking poles. That one guy had a stick. I'm like, how the heck? Get off, get off the trail. So I say, it, and they were doing it together. And a lot of times when these uh, kids graduate, they do it as a team, like with a, with a group, which is great. But when you through hike the Appalachian Trail, especially the AT, not necessarily the Continental Divide, because not a lot of people do it, and you're mostly by yourself unless you start with a group. But a lot of times on the AT, you're with. There's going to be a lot of people, and you connect with people, and you're with a group. So it's not hard. I found myself in a couple of groups when I through hike the AT, although I started by myself. So I would say if they want to do it, do it. It's not. I mean, I'm from Brooklyn. There's more dangerous spots in Brooklyn than there is on the Appalachian Trail. It's not an undiscovered country. There's a lot of people there, and we all look out for each other. So if you want my honest opinion, do it. If, you, if you're thinking about it, do it, because those are lessons they're going to learn, you know, especially going right before college. And also, when they graduate and they go to, like, interviews, they can say they hike the Appalachian Trail, and that's great for their resume. Oh. Uh... All right, there you go, Steph. We'll see if uh, Steph report back. Let us know if you actually tell your son that. Tell your son to reach out to me. I'll <laughs> <give him tips. laughs> 
<laughs> by the book. Okay, uh, Gary writes, okay, let's see here. What's the scariest experience you had due to your inexperience? And then uh, how did you handle interacting with any scary people? Okay, um, I'll answer that last question first. If you it wasn't, There wasn't a lot of scary people on the trail. I did get a lot of reactions for being on a trail because I was different looking. Um, mm. for, and for the most part, the uh, the through hiking community were really tight and we tell each other if there is one or two people on a trail that's kind of weird we let each other know we give each other's each other a heads up um there was an incident a few years ago on the Appalachian Trail and people on social media were saying yeah I saw that individual on the trail and I was warning other people so I didn't have any negative encounters on a trail there were some weird people but i guess in different people and, and people i was hiking with i probably ne not necessarily be hanging out with them but they everyone's out there doing the same thing and um there's no judgment and everyone's cool so i didn't have any any bad interactions with people the scariest thing that happened to me because of my because of not having experience was I would say the bear encounter and uh, there was another, the scariest, scariest was hiking in the snow, in a snowstorm. That was the scariest because um, all I saw, and it's in the book, all I saw was white. I was on top of a mountain. All I saw was just white, like a sheet around me. And I barely saw these footprints in front of me. And we were in a group and we were, we were hiking in pairs, but I left camp later than everyone else and it was two guys waiting for me i said go on ahead i'll be right behind you i'll just follow your footprints and i didn't realize that it was snowing and the wind was blowing so hard that it was starting to cover the footprint and so i lost the trail for a minute and again i was on top of a mountain and if i would have gone one direction i would have been off the mountain off the trail and I could have gotten lost and it was dangerous. There's a lot of people that day that were rescued by, um, by Rangers. So that day, I remember I didn't see the trail. I looked down and I said, I like, I was freaking out, but then something told me just relax and take one step to the left. And I'm getting the chills just saying it. I, it was like a voice in my head to take that one step to the left, not to the right. No, don't go anywhere else, but the left. I took that one big step to the left. And as soon as I took it, I saw like the footprints just barely. And I started following it. And then I saw one person ahead of me. Um, that was the scariest. And the bear encounter was more of me wanting to see a bear because everyone else was seeing a bear. I was like a month and a half into through hiking. I know it's weird. But they were saying, like, if you see a bear, bears normally are like big, scary dog. They just like they see you and they, they run off. You know, they don't necessarily go up to you unless it's toward uh, like hibernation and they're getting hungry. You know, they're before they hibernate. Um, and you got a bag full of Snickers. Exactly. <laughs> and you got a bag <laughs> full of Snickers. Trust me, if a bear wanted my Snickers, I'd be throwing the Snickers at them and I'll go. <laughs> um, but what happened was someone saw i was hiking there was a family in front of me and they were they looked worried and i said what's going on it's like we just saw a bear and i said oh a bear and they're like no no it's a bear right on the trail and i was like i'll get out my way you know there's like a girl sitting on the on the trail I was like, get out get out my way i'm gonna go and i'm running and i see the bear and i take a a, a video of the bear and i pass the bear the bear is maybe a few yards away there's like a little ditch and it's far enough where I feel safe and I pass it and I go, you know what? I'm gonna get a little bit closer. And the bear has its back to, to me and it's eating. And there's a lesson in this, never interrupt or spook a bear when it's eating, like when it's eating grub, don't mess with it. I got closer, started zooming in and the bear saw me. Yeah. Take that note. The bear saw me and it turned around and I didn't know bears could do this. It hissed at me. It was just like, I, I didn't know it could do that. And it leaped. Now, here's the thing. They say, stand your ground and just like hold your trekking poles and make a lot of noise. Don't run. 
I said, the heck with that. I'm running. I ran <laughs> and, and I promise you, there's no way I could outrun a bear. So the, what I think happened and someone, someone else told me this, because once I told them a bear was chasing me, it's like, no, this is what happened. So the trail tur- made a turn. So either I got away, the bear just took a while to get away, you know, to get to me. And I made that turn and it, I just lost it. Or it was a bluff charge. And it wasn't like, because they do bluff charges and you're supposed to stand your ground. Um, because there's no way I was going to escape this bear. But that was me being like just dumb and you know like yeah let me get closer and see and it was a couple more times but you guys are gonna have to read the book in order to get the other story so but yeah that was and I was really upset about it because people were telling me no bears run off they don't chase you and like no every bear I encounter either chases me follows me or wants something from me and they were like well maybe it's your 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 animal your you know your your spirit guide or a spirit animal I'm like, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't want it to be. Why can't it be a chipmunk or something like that? You know, although chipmunks <laughs> are kind of annoying. They, their singing voices are kind of annoying. So I don't know if I want a chipmunk to be my spirit animal. <laughs> they make a lot of money in the movies, though. They get paid. They get paid. They get paid. <laughs> uh, Lisa writes, have you gotten any feedback that your journey has encouraged other people of color to consider hiking or other outdoor adventures. Mm-hmm. Not just people of color, but just people. I get a lot of messages from um, parents that say their kids uh, read my book and now they want to through hike the AT. And that was the one thing about my book is that I wanted to do two things. I wanted to, well, three things. I wanted to keep it funny, humorous, like a walk in the woods. I wanted to keep it positive because I felt like um, Bill Bryson didn't keep it positive with his book. Um, but it's still it's it's an, it's a great read. It's funny, but doesn't really nece- it doesn't necessarily inspire you to go out there. It kind of like deters you from like, OK, I ain't doing that. But I wanted people to be inspired. So I kept it positive. I wanted them to go, hey, not just want to through hike the Appalachian Trail, but step out of their comfort zone, do something out of the ordinary, I mean, live their dream. You know, that's what I wanted to come out of this book. And that's the reaction I was getting from people. Um, I had parents uh, say they've read the book to their kids. And the one thing I wanted to also do was keep it clean. There's no curses in there. Cause I, again, I want to inspire it. I wanted the family to read to their kids. Now I have words that sound close to curses, like son of a Brooklyn bridge, you know, like something like that. I made up some words as well, but they're fun words. I want to keep it like light. Uh, And, um, but yeah, I do get messages from people saying that. um, And I like that because I felt like that's what the walk in the woods was doing. It was inspiring people to through hike. And uh, when hikers uh, do their research, they'll read hiking books and Normally with books, you have a a shelf life of two years and then, you know, that's kind of it with new books. But luckily with this one, uh, every hiking season, the beginning of hiking season, people are picking it up and doing research. So I've I've gotten a lot of messages from that. So, yes. That's awesome to hear. Uh, And I'm looking at the clock. There's a whole lot of questions here. uh, (laughs) <laughs> but I think we're going to have to call it here. Folks will just have to pick up the book, check out the podcast and uh, check you out on social media. Cool. Cool. Thanks guys. Derek, thanks for being with us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me guys. Thank you. All right, folks. Hey, we'll be back here again next Wednesday, again at noon here on the museum's YouTube channel with another edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Uh, Next week, we'll be talking with Tancred Miller about uh, coastal resources here in North Carolina and building resilient communities. So I hope that you'll join us for that one as well. It's going to be a great program. I'm sure of it. Until next time, everybody, like we always say, take care, stay safe, keep your community safe, be well, and uh, I'll see you again real soon. Bye, everybody.